So welcome to our teletherapy webinar. And today we're gonna to be talking about strategies and resources you can use with your babies from zero to three. And so, um, as you know, child development, there's so many different stages in between. So we'll, we'll try to cover as much as we can in this short period. So I do all of my sessions through Zoom and I know not everybody uses Zoom, um, but if you don't know how to use Zoom and wanna use Zoom, that's a YouTube a tutorial that I made, I put together for teachers specifically on how to use Zoom and make sure that you um, incorporate the safety features. These are some of the tips that um, I always go by for, for um, teachers. Ensure your background is plain and simple, kind of like mine. I try to avoid any distractions um, and make sure everything is appropriate for your students. Um, also make sure you have adequate lighting, um, make, the kids are gonna be facing you. And the same thing, ask parents not to sit with their backs to the window because then it's just a shadow on their face. You wanna make sure that you're appropriately, you have appropriate lighting. Um, the other thing too is make sure no beds, um, just no beds, nothing private, just as simple as you can get. Um, make sure you have enough space on your work, you have enough workspace to take notes and to have all of the supplies that you're gonna need. And um, I always say, you're still working, dress as professionally as you can. I know that sometimes I go to parents' house in jeans and t-shirts and you know that's what you wear normally, then that's okay. But definitely try to avoid coming into your telepathy therapy sessions in your pajamas um, and try to keep distractions to a minimum. Obviously, we're all working from home. It's difficult, but as much as you can. And the same thing with parents, you know, ask them to have that TV turned off, not to run the dishwasher or the washing machine while you're working with the students. So when we're talking about the infant population zero to three, there are many things that we have to take into consideration. Their stages of development, the hearing loss, what type of amplification, if any, they have, their hearing age, and the language that the parents have chosen. Um, I work for the public school system. And so because I work in the public school system, I am, well, obviously we're all ethically um, obligated to really tell parents what their options are for communication. And it's up to the parents to decide what mode of communication they wanna use. I have um, parents who are strictly listening in spoken language. I have parents who their children are awaiting um, implants and so they wanna learn baby signs. I have another parent who's awaiting an implant and the baby's 18 months old and they're moved, they've moved past baby signs and wanna learn ASL. And so I've had to bring an interpreter to help teach the family more ASL because I'm not fluent in ASL. And so really just understanding the needs of every, each of your child, right? They're individual. And of course, other needs. I have students that have charge syndrome, down syndrome. I have students that are both deaf and blind. And so really being aware of what your students' needs are. So here are some of the guidelines at least that I've been using for working with my, my kiddos. So the first five to 10 minutes, I check in with the family. So I don't usually, you know, I can, if the child can sit in the high chair or wherever we're gonna use for um, the teletherapy session, I try to say, let's talk a little bit first before you bring them on. Um, or if the child can sit and attend while I'm talking to mom, then that's fine. You know, it depends on the child's age and temperament. Um, you can always save this to the end. If the baby's sitting there and ready to go, you can just move forward. But I always like to check in with them. Any new audiology appoint appointments, any new reports, anything going on with the amplification, um, any new language that you've heard or any new sounds the child is making, anything new, I'd like to always write it down and keep track. Um, and then of course we move into the link sounds and I always make sure that parents are the ones that are doing the link sounds. So I'll sit back and have them do it. Um, let me stop for this question. Got it. Thanks. Great. Um, and then I also like to establish session expectations with the parents, preferably before the meeting. But, you know, today we're going to be all work is going to be in the high chair. Today we're going to cook. So a little bit of time in the high chair. Sometime we're going to we're going to make Play-Doh today. So and then, of course, you know, try not try to feed the baby before we we start the session because you don't want the baby to eat while we're in the middle of a session. So, and parents always involved, you know, I know that I've heard stories where parents sit the toddler down in front of the t the screen and then mom walks away. And I know that happens in the home, right? You show up and they're like, great, now I can go wash the dishes. 
don't allow that. Um, I don't allow it in the home and I'm not going to allow it at teletherapy. So that's something important to remember. Always review what you're going to do, the goals, what activity you're going to use to target the goals. Um, and then make sure that the activities um, really maintain the child's attention and really the parents because you want to make sure that the parents are going to be able to do this activity. You know the parent's temperament best. What are they going to be able to do with the child? What, what won't they be embarrassed to do in front of you? Because I know that some of my parents won't sing in front of me, but I will give them the links to the songs and say, okay, practice the song and I want you to sing to the child. And then the next time around, I'll sing. And if the child is doing the finger plays or the hand movements, then I know the parents have practiced. So really be, be cognizant of the temperaments in the family. Um, lesson plan should include literacy. I always include a book to read at the end. Either I read it, mom reads it, I show mom how to read it, we read it once or twice. Um, again, it really depends on each child and each family. And then I always assign what I call homework. It's not really homework, but it's the activity that we did in the session. I want you to practice that with your child throughout the week. So that's a big component of the homework, right? Because we're only with them a few minutes and we're not really directly working with them. We're the coach. And so the parents are required to do all of the work at home. And so I always, at the beginning of my check-in, that's when I check in and I say, okay, let's see how they're doing with this activity. Um, what did you see to make sure that the parents are on top of it? And then I always have a goodbye song. Um, I always, it's, I try to make sure that there's always a routine. And then, of course, giving parents time to ask. You know, the kids may not last for longer than maybe 20 minutes, um, but again, it's mostly coaching. So once the baby's done, you sing goodbye out of the high chair and they can go run and play while um, you talk with mom. And it just really depends. But if you think about preschool kids, when you do um, circle time, it's 10 to 15 minutes. And here we have kids that are younger than preschool. And so we can't really expect them to stay in front of a screen for an hour. So just keeping that in mind. What I use to drive my lessons is the learning to listen sounds. And whether my students are using baby signs, ASL, or listening in spoken language, I really use these to drive um, the language because most of my kids, even if they're using baby signs or ASL, they're, they're looking toward the future, which is a cochlear implant. And so I teach the learning to listen sounds, whether it's in signs. So all of my babies will learn how to sign all of those learning to listen sounds um, or the animals so that when it comes time to, to really start using spoken language, they'll already, I'll be able to use um, an auditory sandwich, but with the signs. Um, and I also use tactile. So let me show you, um, for those of you that may not be familiar. So this is my the best copy I could get because I usually copy it out of the castles and give it to the parents, both in English and in Spanish. Um, I don't have castles with me because I haven't been able to go to my office, but um, this is an old copy I had and I scanned it. Very, I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, you know, the stereotypical phrases, uh, omnomatopia, these are all very important. And these are kind of what I use to guide my lessons most of the time, but obviously it depends on the students' needs. So hearing first has, um, they're beautiful. <laughs> Theirs looks much better than mine. But um, you can download this and email it to parents if you haven't had a chance to give parents a copy. But this is kind of what I use to guide my students, especially those that are, that are really just language focused and don't have any other needs besides um, the hearing loss. Um, and so when I work with learning to listen sounds, I use a lot of tactile for my kiddos who are awaiting the cochlear implants. Um, definitely feeling under your throat, um, visual, um, look at my mouth, how am I placing my mouth? Oh, ah, uh, um, I really help parents learn to do this at home with their students and so with their kids. And so that's something to keep in mind. I'm gonna start with the zero to four. So when you're looking at your zero to four months, you're looking at babies that are just starting to smile, looking at parents, cooing, gargling, holding their heads up, they're responding to affection, they're starting to learn to hold toys, maybe they're starting to roll over, they're pushing up on elbows. And it's really important for us to know this so that we can tailor our lessons to make sure that we're focusing on every aspect of development because really we're not just focusing on, on their hearing loss, we're focusing on all aspects of, of development. Well, at least, um, 
in my situation working for the public school system that's kind of that's what my credential is working zero to four my students don't have somebody else that comes to work with them on all other aspects of development that's it i'm it so i work on all aspects of development including listening and spoken language and so because we get the kids so young most of the time um this is a great opportunity to really um get the parents attention and to really put and still in them good habits. And so one of the, the videos that I like to show to parents at the very beginning is the importance of their back and forth or serve and return. And I'm sure many of you have seen this video, but if you haven't, um, I'm gonna go ahead and show it to you. Key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, New neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling facial expressions and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before. Ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage in serve and return interaction, beginning in infancy, builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. Um, I really like to show this video to my parents, both English and Spanish speaking, because I will just use the Spanish subtitles, because I really want them to, to understand how important it is for us to put the work in right now and get into the habits of that serve and return and really that interaction um, and how it's going to make such a difference for them when they get older. And um, I love that video. I've seen it at... Um, at presentations. I've seen it when I've gone to AG Bell, I believe. I've seen it everywhere. It's everywhere. So um, definitely, I, I love using that because the parents really start to think about how important it is. Because many times parents are like, oh, well, they're so little. They don't do anything. You know, they're just there to look at and that's it. And really, no, this is the time when their brains are making all of these connections. And so I, I really emphasize to parents the importance of, of making sure that you're involved. And so if we look at this child development from zero to four months if the kids are smiling they're looking at you that's a great opportunity for serve and return and that's when we also start instilling the wait time right so we'll say i'll say to a mom okay hold the baby look at your child and then start smiling or, or talking to them it can be anything like oh today i saw the news or it's raining outside but you know really that mother ease or parent ease um talk and then stop and then wait for the child to coo or gargle and then respond, right? And so you're starting to teach those concepts of how conversations work. And yes, there's zero to four months, but this is when we start teaching these habits. And so um, if I was doing teletherapy, I would do the exact same thing. I would say, okay, stand in front of the, the, the screen and let me see you do this. Okay, mom, wait a little bit longer before you talk again. And so this is what I would do. Um, and of course, we're working on all aspects of development. I would say, Let's see some tummy time, mom. Turn the camera around or the iPad, the, I, the tablet, your computer, turn it around. Let me see you put the baby on tummy time. And when you're putting the baby on tummy time, don't just flip them over. Let them know what's happening because you want to get parents into that habit, right? So I would, just like this, I've, I've done it already. I say, okay, turn it around. Let me see. Okay, let me hear you though. Don't just turn him over. I want to hear you say, oh, we're going to turn you over. It's tummy time now. Let's see you. Let's see, lift up your head. I know it's so hard. And really modeling that, um, that sports caster, right? That modeling what you want the child to see, modeling what you're th or thinking out loud, what the child is probably feeling. And yes, here you are um, giving the children language. And so that's kind of a big part of zero to four. 
months is all parent involvement. It really is having them use all of this. And so I also do lean six at zero to four months. If they have some sort of residual hearing, if they've already gotten their hearing aids, we're using lean sounds, even if they haven't been aided yet, because we want to teach the parents to really have those lean sounds memorized. And so at this stage, we're mostly working on detection, right? Are the babies startling? Are they lifting their eyebrows? Are they opening their eyes wide? Um, what are they doing to show us that they've heard the sound? Because right now the babies aren't yet turning to a sound, right? They're, they're just barely starting to learn to hold their heads up and maybe start rolling over, maybe pushing up on elbows. So really trying to teach parents what's the best way to see if your student is detecting the lean sounds. So that's kind of what I do zero to four months. It's all on the screen and it's all parents doing everything. I mean, that's really what we're trained in to be coaches. And so that's what I see at zero to four months. That's what I do. And then of course, reading books. I emphasize at zero to four months, the importance of reading books. And um, parents always look at me funny because they're like, why, why would I read a book? And I say, it is so important for you to read a book right now because you're, again, it's language. You're catching, you're doing the serve and return. You're making all those connections in the brain right now. You're just making your child smarter, basically, because parents love to hear that we're helping their children be, you know, more smarter, really. And so um, that's kind of what I work on. And so one of the things that I, I teach parents how to read the book to the babies, right? Um, I always try to ask them if they, if they can't. I, I get a lot of books from the Salvation Army or um, on my next door app, neighbors are always giving books away or selling them really cheap. I buy them and I just give them to the families, but I know not all of us can do that. Um, so this is a photorealistic book. I always ask parents to try to do as many photorealistic books as possible, maybe later on, zero to four, it's not that big a deal. The biggest part right now is really speaking. But um, I say, you don't have to read all of this text, right? Or you can in parent ease. But what my biggest focus is, here we are, learning to listen sounds, right? Choo-choo, baby, look at the baby, he's playing, choo-choo, push the toy. Okay, so I don't normally speak like this to the babies. I'm usually more high-pitched and animated, but it seems weird doing that without a baby present. <laughs> but um, so I tell them, you know, focus on those learning to listen sounds. Mmm, a banana, ba 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 banana Mmm, apple, baby, baby's eating, right? We're not even using the words here. It's just simple words, focusing on those words with the babies, right? Here we are. Wash, 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 wash the baby. So I really like to teach parents how to read the books to the kiddos. Um, and then I'll say, okay, let me watch you read a book. And I, I will ask them like, ahead of time, you know, what book do you have? And let me see you read the book. And then maybe giving them um, strategies or praising them for, you know, doing a good job. Um, the six to 12 months. So at six to 12 months, we're seeing a lot of, um, a lot of growth, right? In every aspect, cognition, social, emotional, um, physical, we're seeing a lot. And so we're starting to see that stranger danger. Like when you show up and all of a sudden the baby's not happy to see you and they cling to mom and you're like, what happened? That's what's happening. They're starting to realize who family is, who strangers are. They're starting to cling to mom and Again, it's so good that you've been coaching parents all along because it's okay that they don't want to come to you or play with you because the point is that the parents are the ones that are involved in doing all of the work. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for helping. Um, and so now the baby's also playing with others, right? They're grasping toys. They're starting to say, ah, eh, oh, mama, mama, ba, 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 ba. They understand what no means. They know peekaboo. They're sitting, they're crawling, and they're standing. So now your, your options for playing with children are a lot greater. And so at six to 12 months, what I like to do with parents is I like to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Do you have a light blanket or a handkerchief at home? Um, have that ready, have the bubbles ready, have a book ready, have a couple of your farm animals. What farm animals do you have? Because those are all part of the learning to listen sounds. And so what I'll do is I'll say, I need you to have that all lined up, not on the baby's um, tray, have it on the table next to the baby. And then when we get started, then I say, okay, mom, let's have you, um, let's use the bubbles, but don't show the bubbles yet. I want you first to sing bubbles, bubbles, pop, pop, pop and then blow the bubbles. Wait till she pops them all and they're all gone. 
and she'll sit there and look at you. Um, I'm thinking of children. That's why I'm saying she, because I just did this with the family. Wait till she looks at you, sing the song again, and then blow the bubbles again. Because we want the child to have that auditory memory of whenever I hear my mom sing that song, the bubbles are going to come. And so we're really now starting to work on that auditory memory. I am not sharing anything right now. So I will, sh I will swap when I share next time. But right now I'm just speaking. Um, so again, this is, this is what we can do is have parents do all of the work, right? So I stand back. And sometimes I see parents just want to start blowing bubbles right away. And I will say, oh, let's wait, you know, let's wait and see. Let's see if they'll ask. Let's wait and see if they'll vocalize. You know, even if they go, ah, or, mm, or like hit the table, we want to respond to that mom. And so really the whole time explaining to her why we're doing what we're doing, you know, because parents need to understand what the purpose is of our activities. Um, the same thing with the peekaboo. So I was playing peekaboo with the family. And I said, um, I want you to do it now, bring out your handkerchief. And so the mom said, okay. And so she started doing it and the baby just started laughing way more with mom than she was with me on the screen. It's not the same, right? Really at this age, mom and dad are their favorite toys, right? Their favorite playmates. And so it was really great to see that. Um, they understand no. So I always, really encourage parents to stay away, away from the word no, because if you start using no all the time, what's the first thing they're going to say to you when they're, go they're two years old, right? No, that's all you're going to hear. So I always ask parents to really use language that is more moving the behavior, right? So we're not doing that right now. You know, right now we're not throwing our cereal. Right now we're going to play peekaboo. You know, right now we're not going to chew our book. Oh, we don't chew books in the house. And so really we focus on that type of behavior rather than saying no, because no is too easy and that's quick and you've got no language there. You want to focus on saying, adding as much language as you can, expanding your sentences and really feeding language to your child. Just by saying no, that's not enough. You know, you're not, you're not challenging the child to really think. So this is kind of what I do. Um, with the lean sounds, six to 12 months, it's now detection and possibly producing some of those sounds, right? We start hearing the ums, the ahs, the oohs, um, maybe s's, maybe shh, but definitely the other ones, the e's. And so again, I will ask mom to sit behind the child or stand behind the child. If mom and dad are both there, I'll let them do it on their own. I'll say, hey, dad, distract her with one of the quiet toys with the bubbles. And then I'll say, okay, mom, stand behind her on um, the better hearing ear and then start doing the link sounds. If it's just a mom and a child or a dad and a child, I will help with the distractions. And so one of the things that I do, so I'll stop sharing because now I'm gonna, I am gonna show something. So one of the things I do is I use a, a balloon and you would be surprised at how, um, how um, distracted children get with balloons, but they love balloons. And so what I'll say is I'll say, you stand behind the child if they have a Ling Six kit, I try to give my parents a Ling Six kit as much as I can. They don't always have, um, a lot of parents don't have it or sometimes they'll lose it. Um, even though I say, keep the Ling Six kit away from the kids. We only use that during therapy, but um, many times they'll lose it. But if they have the Ling Six kit, um, which most of my parents do, I'll say, okay, I'm gonna distract the baby. And so whoever the baby is, I'll be like, you know, hey, Adam, look at me, look at me. And then I'll say, look at the balloon. So you really need to use your camera. Look at the balloon. Look at that. I'm going to blow it. Watch. And so then I do, I start blowing it. And really using the camera because now the kid can't see me anymore. And they're really interested. And that's when mom usually does the lean sounds. When she does the lean sounds, peekaboo, I'm right here. You heard it. You heard mommy say, mm. and mom, if she said, mm, will bring out her um, her ice cream, right? I usually get the bubble ice creams from the Dollar Tree, which is a pack of three for a dollar. And that's usually what I use for my lean kits. And so then I say, okay, bye-bye balloon. And we do it all over again with each of the lean sounds. And that's how I help distract the child while mom is doing the lean sounds if, if another parent isn't around. That's kind of how I move forward with the kids. Again, it's always the parents and they have their kits in front of them. Then we do the, um, the handkerchief peekaboo I also ask for the bigger blankets. Um, I just recently did this with one of my kiddos. We're learning up, 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 
and down. And so um, I asked parents to do this with the baby. And um, so yeah, she had to come out of her high chair. They all sat there as if it was a parachute and everybody said up, up, up and down. And one of the things that I was trying to have the parents focus on is really getting, she's newly implanted. So really trying to get her to just say, uh, uh, uh. And so it was a lot of tactile, uh, 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 feel mommy, uh, uh, uh. And um, she didn't do it for two weeks, but by the third week, we heard her saying, uh, uh, uh. And so it was pretty amazing. Um, again, that was all parents work. The next age group is 12 to 36 months. So here at this stage, the kids can do so much more, right? They're already starting to learn language rapidly from 12 months to two years the amount of language they learn, whether it's spoken language or ASL is increasing. It is, and really from 18 months to two years, it's just labeling everything. And I, and the good thing is, is that from zero to four, we did that serve and return, right? From four or from six months to 12 months, we really focused on um, incorporating language in all of activities, really activities for language learning, right? The animals, the farm animals moo, the duck quack quack, We've been working on that all along, that now at 12 to two years old is when they need to learn so much language because at two years old, what happens? The two word utterances. You can't produce two word utterances if you don't have the language for it. And a lot of people call it the terrible twos. But if you think about it, the only, it's not terrible, it's the kids have, are now ready to become more independent. And so, if our kids, especially our kids who are deaf and hard of hearing, don't have the language, then they will be terrible twos, right? Because they don't have the language to express what they want. They don't want it. They don't have the language to express what they don't want. And so we'll start seeing behaviors like hitting, biting, kicking. And so we're trying to avoid that. That's why we set the foundation at zero to four months, at six to 12 months, right? The importance of those ling sounds. I mean, I'm sorry, the learning to listen sounds because it's not just, oh yeah, my kid needs to know what a cow does, says, right? What a cow is and what it says. It's really letting parents understand that those learning to listen sounds are not just um, vocabulary that kids need to learn, but they're integral parts to learning to speak and listen. And really it's those muscle movements in your mouth to help you produce other words like quack, right? You're moving from an ooh to an ah. All of our babies who have hearing loss the first sound they make is always ah. And that's the first ling sound that they detect. It's the first ling sound they produce because that is so easy for them, ah. And so we, I try so hard, even with my kiddos that are awaiting their implants to really start producing oohs and e's because I want that mouth movement to be ready to go once they get those implants and we start working on language to really focus on being able to make those sounds. Well, not just for intelligibility, but really just for language in general. And so I've already set the stage from zero to 12 months, that from 12 to 36 months, now we're going forward, full speed ahead, right? Here we go. You already know all the strategies that I've taught you from zero to 12 months. Let's put them to use, right? Language songs. Right now is, you know, when they were younger, you know, learn to sing a song with the baby, right? Morning song, afternoon song, um, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, et cetera. But at this age, now we're focusing on not just singing, but chants. We want chants for everything that you do all day long. Because a lot of times, you know, as much as you tell parents, I need you to repeat these words all the time. Like you need to constantly say the same thing over and over for your child to be able to learn the language. The best way is really chants, right? Elongating those words. Because chants really stick to children's heads and really they just pick up on language a lot faster with chants. So this is the way we wash our hands. Etc. So if I have a 12 to 36 month or a 12 month old in front of me, so I'm going to pause share. At 12 months, if they're sitting in front of the high chair, what I like to do to help parents, and I always model the activity and then give it over to parents. And this is a lot of planning with the parents to make sure they have something similar to what you're modeling with. So for example, I have this um, box, it socks came in it and I just I'm a teacher, I never throw anything away. And so it happens to have bananas on it, which is great because we're working on the ba 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 sound. Look, it's a banana. And really you're gonna have to learn to use your camera, right? 
There it is. It's a banana. Ba ba ba. Mom, can you have them? Can you repeat banana? Because we don't know the quality of the sound for the child, and especially based on with their amplification. Because my babies don't have FM systems, so um, I always have parents repeat it. Ba 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 banana. Mom, ask her to listen. So mom's telling her, listen, listen, and then I'll repeat it after mom does it. So this time mom's the one doing it, and I'm repeating it. Yeah, listen. Shake, shake, shake. Oh, mom, say shake, 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 shake. Because I think that there might also be a lag with the sound. I'm not sure. So I always make sure that mom is always repeating it. Shake, shake, shake. I'm going to open. Mom, can you say open and say it like that? Because sometimes they'll be like, yeah, open. And I'm like, nope, say long O, please. Open. And then here we go. Open. <gasps> What's inside? And I don't show them, right? I'm not really quite showing it to them. And so then that really captures the child's attention. And, I'm, and the whole time I'm telling mom, this is what I want you to do. Don't let them have it. Because a lot of times parents are like, oh, well, she wants it. And I say, no, no, no. You control the toys. Don't let her have it. Just like she can't grab my box, don't let her grab your bag or box. Shake, shake, shake. What's inside? Look, I'm looking. And I, I always let parents know that the reason I'm taking so long to get the surprise out is because really what we're focusing on now is that attention, having them to attend longer, okay? Because that's what we want them to do, attend to longer books, attend to activities for longer, right? 10 to 15 minutes, that's what we're trying to focus on. <gasps> what could be inside? And then, oh, what is it? And this is where you're gonna use your um, camera, right? <gasps> it's a dog, rough, rough, or wow, wow, whatever parents are gonna use. It's a dog. Look, a white dog. Mom, let her know what, what's on the dog's head. Ask her or tell her what's on the dog's head. It's a red bow. It's a dog. And then we do this again with whatever items you have. Um, I happen to have this tiny little chair in there. And so um, sometimes I'll say, again, using the camera, right? Does a dog sit on the chair? No, 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 dog. No sitting on the chair. No, no, no. So, I mean, there's so many ways that you can play with this. And again, working with the parents. Now, I want to see you do it with whatever you have at home, mom. This is what I want you to do. And so we work that way. That's one activity that I do with my 12, with my one-year-olds um, that they really like. Um, another thing that I do with them is um, this. So I happen to have a jack-in-the-box. Um, a lot of parents don't, but this is another one that I like to use with parents to, again, work on their attention span and also having them listen. So I happen to have a good microphone. I don't know what type of mic the computer microphones. I don't know if they're great, but this really has them work on their listening, right? So I'm sure that you probably don't hear it that well, or maybe you do. And really having them wait. This is kind of long, right? And they're waiting. Oh, did you hear that? I keep going. And then, of course, this is a great opportunity for mom to say, oh, my gosh, did you see it pop out? Oh, my goodness, it's the hungry caterpillar. Oh, it's, you know, he's red, depending on the age, if they're older. The red one, the green one. Um, but again, I'm not here to entertain the child. It's really parent training, right? Telling the parent, this is the strategies that you can use at home. Um, I'm just modeling for you. So one of the other things that from 12 to 36 months, you know, the, especially at 12 months, um, they're already starting to pour, pour things in containers, right? And emptying them out and pouring things, pulling pots and pans and banging on things because they're cruising, right? They're either cruising or crawling all over the house. And so when it comes to the Lean Six, now we're moving past um, detection and production, right? Or not moving past it, but moving ahead, right? They can detect it, right? They're turning their heads now. Every time they hear it, they turn over to mom. Actually, they do so well that every time you go like this, they just turn because they know that something's coming. So we're gonna, if they've already done that and they've picked up on that, we're gonna stop doing that. Now, again, I'll distract the child and then I'll have mom say, okay, 
um, give a bucket if mom has a bucket or a Tupperware container and maybe some blocks or any toys she has. It doesn't have to be a toy. It could be anything in the house, buttons if they're big or little balls, whatever she has, because now the child can use, oh, thank you. Um, now the child can use uh, uh, behavioral responses, right? Listen, listen, and then, you know, I can use my um, my screen or mom can sit behind and she has to listen. And only when you listen, can you drop it in the bucket. And so now we're doing behavioral response because now they're getting older and they should be able to do it unless of course they have other needs. But this is where we're moving toward is, okay, behavioral response. I heard it. I'm putting it in the bucket. I heard it. I'm putting it in the bucket. And really you're helping the audiologist because now the audiologist is going to expect that and you're there to help. Um, one of the other things that you can do as they start moving closer to two and to three, and sometimes little kiddos who are really bright can do it sooner, is now we're working on um, uh, discrimination, right? So now you hear an mm, you're looking for the ice cream. Where's the ice cream? Well, they can't point, right? You're not in front of them with the, with the Ling Six kit. And so now you have to think, okay, how am I going to do this? But luckily, um, there's some amazing teachers out there on Teachers Pay Teachers who make uh, amazing um, resources for us. And one of them is the Boom Cards Lick Ling Six Sounds. And so um, if you're not familiar with Boom Cards, I've covered them in, in other trainings, but um, Boom Cards are great. Right now, I think you get free membership because of the um, pandemic. But these are great because you can make it interactive. So if the parents are on um, uh, an iPad, um, it would be great because the student can just tap on it. Um, or if they're on a computer, then the, the student can point and the parent can um, click on it. But basically you can share your screen and the student will be able to tap on it. So it has it here. E you can do that, but I always say to the parents, I want to hear you do it because again, we don't want the computer sound. We want the parents natural sound. So I'll say parent, you know, I can text them or I can just ahead of time, give them the list. The first one's going to be E have them say it. And then the student can tap on it. Oops. Nope. That's not it. Listen again, mom, can you repeat it again? E and then, Oh yeah. The car says E. Um, and again, you can do this with the child sharing the screen with them or giving them remote control on the iPad. And again, this is interactive, right? Once they start turning two or three, they're kind of ready to start doing this. I do always emphasize parents try to avoid as much screen time as possible, but due to this pandemic, we're kind of left to, to have to use this. And if we're going to use screen time, might as well make it interactive and fun. Who is the creator of that boom card? I am not sure, but you know what I did is I went into boom cards and I just typed in lean. And when, when I typed in lean on the decks and put zero to three, that came up and there were a bunch of them, but that one was the one that I, I liked the most. So um, one of the other things that I do with my families is that I really try to emphasize pretend play, um, especially once they turn, you know, one, between one and three, I really try to say, let's start doing pretend play. Let's have them um, understand that people think different things. Like we're already working on theory of mind, right? Other people see things differently. And so pretend play is a big part of it. And um, so this is a toy that I have and I happened, I think to get it at the garage sale. Um, but um, so this little playground, uh, this is when you have to kind of start getting creative with how you use your, your computer's camera. So I'm gonna use my box and I'm gonna sit it on top of the box. Obviously you can't see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna bring my camera down and there you have it. Now they can see the, the um, toy. And so at this point I would ask the mom, oh my gosh, what's happening? What do you see? Wh what's going on? So um, I say, look, we're gonna use the ladder. Mom, can you say ladder? Mom, let the child know that you go up, up, up on a ladder. Yeah. That's what we want to do. And so then I'll put the ladder down. And that happens quite often. That's the one thing I don't like about this toy. Um, and then I'll say, okay, should we get a boy or a girl? Who are we going to get? A 
boy. Look at the boy. Say hi to the boy. So you see, I mean, this is kind of, I'm almost going to say like reminiscent of Blue's Clues, but really just trying to gain the child's attention um, to teach them to attend a little bit longer for this pretend game that we're going to go up, up, up. And so then, okay, mom, ask your child to say up, up, up. If they can't say it, it's okay. Mom models it up, up, up. And then Miss Sophia's having them go up, up, up. And then they're up. There they are. He's up. He's going to go down the slide. Wee. Again, just really focusing on those learning to listen sounds. Okay, he's going to go wee. Obviously, my camera won't go that far, but wee. And you just hear a crash. And I'll say, uh-oh. He fell down. Mom, can you repeat? Uh-oh. Ask him what's wrong. What's wrong with the baby? And then I'll bring the baby out or the little boy out. I'll be like, oh no, he fell down. Tell him to stand up, stand up. And then we're going to do it again. And um, it's funny because when I do this, the moms are like, oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. I was having so much fun watching you play. And so <laughs> I always try to bring the parents back to be part of it. But I'm only gonna do this if I know that the parent has, and it doesn't have to be a similar toy, but has a toy where they can say up, 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 we and down, because that's kind of what our focus is. It doesn't have to be a similar toy. It could be a train where they can go up, up, up on the train and the train goes we. Um, I just wanna model to parents how we play pretend with little dolls, because at that, at that age, around 18 months, two years, they're already starting to realize, oh, this little doll can walk, walk, walk. This little doll can go up, up, up. And so that's kind of something that, that we can focus on. We, I'll bring this up with a girl, with a girl, and I'll say, oh, the girl goes on the swing. We stop. We stop. And so again, always focusing on language. It's always something mom can do if they happen to have a playground in the backyard. That's definitely something that I will use. Um, it just really depends on the child and what's at home. A lot of this teletherapy is planning with the parents. Um, like if you're gonna make um, uh, Play-Doh, homemade Play-Doh, make sure that they have cream of tartar at home, right? Because if they don't have that, they can't make Play-Doh. So it's always a lot of planning. And I do some cooking with families, like making pancakes is pretty easy with the kids, even making eggs. It's now you're starting to get into the more um, hands-on things that you can use with you can do with children and really emphasizing to parents the importance of giving the children autonomy right because that's how you avoid those terrible twos is from 12 to 2 is you start giving them options you start helping me cook you serve everybody thank you for your help what do you want to drink do you want milk or do you want water um, really just giving them options and sometimes parents are like are to me they're little kids, they can't do that. It's like, no, they can. Um, parents don't, we're just so used to like, especially if there's more children in the house and it's time to eat, everybody just gets served, everybody automatically gets their drink. And then that's language opportunity missing, lost, right? And it's like, take the time, ask each child first and then go to your toddler and then ask them. And then if you do that, they have already heard all the modeling from their siblings then it's their turn and you're gonna get language more that way. And it's really teaching parents to be patient and taking the time to really go through each activity on their own. So I'm gonna go through and show you some more of the online resources and they're all pretty much boom cards. Um, music, I always assign a song to parents, um, whether it's um, the wheels on the bus, I really like the wheels on the bus because we're working on those learning to listen sounds, right? Swish, 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 round and round, beep, 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 wah, 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 shh, shh, shh. So um, I really like to assign that. I tell the parents, try not to have the kids watch the YouTube video. I will send it to the parents and say, this is how it goes because it's been so long, especially to some of my new parents that they've heard those songs, they, they forget the melody. And so I say, this is the song, here's the link, listen to it. And then um, I want you to sing. Don't sing the whole song. I want you to focus on these sounds. And I usually do up and down, um, shh, blink, blink, beep, beep, and wow, wow, wow. Those are the only five that I kind of start with. Once they know those and I see the kids doing this, then I'll add on some more. But for the most part, um, those are the first five that I do. But I try to say, try not to. 
But if they do want songs, I always look for my favorite version of the wheels on the bus, which isn't so busy and loud. My favorite version of um, Old MacDonald Had a Farm, where it's kind of slower and takes its time. And um, I probably should have brought it up for you, but um, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star from Super Simple Learning or Super Simple Songs, I think it's called. They have a lot of really great songs for language. Again, I if you're gonna watch the video, then I say, okay, you can show them this video because it's slower and um, and you can stop it and and talk a little bit about it. So um, here I would either, you know, turn down the volume and just say an owl. An owl says, hoot, hoot. What do you think the owl's gonna do? Look at his eyes, he's looking around. So really just taking the time to put language in there. So then the song starts and, um, you know, sing along with the child because you want them to hear parent songs. So always encourage the parents, like, can you sing while this is going on? Because I can't, there is a lag and I don't want to cause that. So I'll sit back and be quiet and have the parents sing along with the song if they know the words. Um, then when it pauses, I'll add language and tell parents, you know, give the children more language, give them more opportunity to hear more language. Um, so like here, oh, what's happening? Look, he's looking because I don't care if they listen to the music. Oh, they're saying hi to each other. Look, he looks happy. Big eyes, big eyes. They're holding hands. They're friends. And so that's usually what I'll do. And I'll tell parents, this is kind of what we have to do is like, you know, when there's a break, don't just have them listen to music and empty sounds. Use it as an opportunity to feed language as much as you can. You know, we always have the analogy of the, um, sportscaster, right? If you're listening to a baseball game on the radio, they're giving you the play-by-play. -play. That's kind of what we tell parents as well, right? All day long, language as much as you can, every opportunity you can. By the end of the day, it's like your throat should be hurting. And so parents are like, yeah, sometimes that happens. And so that's kind of what I always encourage parents, every opportunity to expand on language, to provide language any way that you can. So I want to show you some of the other boom cards that I found that I, um, that I like. So this one's a good one. This one's choose the correct answer. If you're working on colors, I mean, our kiddos aren't really, they, I mean, some of them do, a lot of them actually do know colors. Um, I kind of don't use it this way. If I know that they want the red one, I'll say, where's the strawberry? Because to me, it's more important that the child knows how to say strawberry than knows which color is which, right? Colors they'll learn in preschool. But right now I want them to have that functional um, language. Um, and then, so we can do this. Somebody just told me I have eight minutes left and that's okay. Cause I'm just about done. Um, this one again, language where you give, um, the language, find the fork, and then they'll be able to click it themselves. Really interactive. Um, this one's really good. Um, our children are starting cognitively. It should be able to put together puzzles. And so here we are a puzzle game. So here's one. Who is it? Look, he's kind of fluffy, he's kind of white. He says, bah, who is it? It's a sheep, put it together. And at least their reward is that they're gonna be able to put together a puzzle. Um, and then this one. So this one I like because the animals are right in front of the child, right? They don't have to imagine it. They're both in front of them. Which one is black and white? You know, we don't have to move on to milk because maybe our zero to three year or our 12 to three year olds aren't ready for that. But definitely um, they can, you know, black and white, which one says moo, you know, and then let them click on it and then they can move on to the next, the next slide. So there are a lot of boom cards that can be used for maybe our two to three year olds um, because their understand their receptive language is great. Um, it should be if parents have been working along and we've got them aided and we've been doing all the strategies, their, their receptive language should be enough to say, which one says wow, wow, or wags his tail. Um, hopefully they can do this um, expressively. Now you know they're working on two to three word utterances. So these are really great. And let me see. Um, and then the last one is books. Now I love this web page because it has animated books. Um, the only thing is, is that they have a lot of music in the background. So you can always um, just the vol low, um, just turn down the volume. I suppose you could do that. But um, I'm just going to give you a quick sample of this books. Um, and again, this is for older kids. You're not going to do this for the younger 
you know, zero to 18, well, maybe an 18 month old, but zero to 12, no. So I like this book. I'm gonna turn it up if you wanna hear it. So this is very repetitive. And I like how slow he's speaking. And the child saw a cat. And the whole book is a cat, a cat, a cat. And look at how much time it's giving us. And you have time to put like, look, the dog looked up. There, he saw the cat. So if you're going to use digital books, um, definitely, I think they need to be animated for this age group. Um, because if you're going to watch a video on YouTube of somebody reading a book, it's probably better that the parent read the book or that you read the book, because then you're giving the language that you're targeting or the language goal. One of the things that um, is really important in teletherapy is when you're reading books to kiddos is to use your camera. So I read this one earlier and I put it up to the screen. I've noticed that the best way to use the camera is to put go underneath. Um, this one has a hole so I was able to see what I was doing. Um, but underneath is really the best way. And it really makes it interactive and you're teaching parents how to read books. So No David is one of the favorites for two-year-olds because you know, they're starting to get in trouble. Um, and so this is really good to use the camera this way. <gasps> What's he doing? Oh no, it's going to fall down. <gasps> oh no, look, the books. And really have parents involved. So I will say point to the books, mom. Like show him that he's going to fall off the books. So <gasps> mom is angry. So I start from the bottom and work my way up. <gasps> look at her tapping her toes. Mom, tap toes to show what angry looks like when you're tapping your toes. Mom, put your hand on your waist so that she, he can see what it looks like when you're angry. <laughs> You'll see a lot of me peeking this way to make sure I the, what I want in front of the camera is in front of the camera. So um, I really try to make it seem like it's animated to catch their attention. So I will say things like, oh, he's jumping on the bed. Look, oh, jump, 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 jump. And mom says no. So really using the camera to your advantage and then saying, okay, mom, this is what I want you to do with your kids at home. Whenever you have a book where there's someone's jumping or someone's running, you make the motions. Run, run, run. Jump, jump, jump. Um, it's, you know, that's kind of what I encourage parents to do. But again, remember, we're not here to entertain kids. We're really here to coach parents because they're the ones doing all the work at home. And so, of course, I always finish off with a goodbye song, you know, Bye bye, Adam, and whoever it is. And we finish off with a goodbye song because I always encourage parents to. Um, where I go and boom is I go to, um, I just click preschool and then whatever comes up on preschool. And if there's something I see that I like, because preschool is the youngest that they have. And so that's what I tend to use. So I'm sorry for those that didn't see. Um, this is kind of how I use the camera, asking mom to point. Um, the jumping, oh no, <gasps> look at his bottom, come back and put your clothes on, don't go away, kind of giving the effect that he is like running farther away, um, oh no, look how angry he is, and really showing what the face looks like when they're angry, um, again, using the camera to your, to your advantage, I, I do have my Link 6 kit with me, I usually have as much as I can here, because if, for example, I'm talking to mom and the baby's getting a little um, antsy, I'll always have something that I can show them like, look at my airplane, ah, and while mom's talking and I'm listening to her, you know, because there is a lot of talking with mom. And if we were sitting in the mom's home, I would be doing the same thing, but I can't. And so I try to make sure to have something here to entertain the child while mom and I are trying to talk about um, progress. So um, I know that this is kind of, um, where did you purchase your Ling Sound toys? Okay, so the Dollar Tree is my favorite place to go. So um, these are on the Dollar Tree, the mouse. Um, you can buy a package of three for a dollar, and I always buy a ton of them for my kids. They have the little airplanes, I buy them, but I happened to see this at a garage sale, and I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. This will last forever. Um, this was an, uh, 
Christmas ornament in Target and I just bought it because I loved it. But usually I'll use the ice cream bubbles that they have at the Dollar Tree and it's a pack of three for a dollar. I always make my own ghosts. I just buy, I have a bunch of white felt and it's already pre-cut and then I just, you know, sloppily sew it around and stick some black felt eyes and mouth on it. Um, the, these are at the dollar store. You can buy them for a dollar each. Um, the only thing that costs me the most is these babies. Whenever I find a package of three or four babies, I always buy it because I'll, at least I'll get four babies for $12 rather than buying one for $6.99 or $5.99. And then I just take advantage and buy them. But I do um, tend to put a, a Link 6 kit together for most of my families. So um, I know I've gone a minute over and I kind of tried to go through what I do in a regular session. I don't know if it was helpful. Like I said, I can do this zero to three. I've been working with them for the last five years. And so I can do this class for three hours, but um, I know we didn't have time. Well, um, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I hope it was helpful. Um, this is just something that I do. Um, but if you have any questions, you have my email and uh, thank you.